Hey everyone, welcome to our eighth FreeBSD Friday. I'm Deb Goodkin, the Executive Director of the FreeBSD Foundation. So first, I'd like to thank all of you who've been watching our series and just to remind you that you can always watch the recording. Uh, the recordings as well as the schedule will be on our website and we will make sure we post the link on the um, IRC channel here. Also, if you have a question during the talk today, please, you can post that in the IRC channel and also remember to proceed it with a big Q so we know it's a question. So today, our presentation is an introduction to jails by Michael Lucas. So here's a little bit about Michael. After using Unix since the late 80s and spending 20 odd years as a network and system administrator, Michael is now a full-time writer. Currently, he's working on a book on transport layer security because 2020 needed to be just a little bit tougher. Known for his clever sense of humor, we also know him as being our fearless leader in guiding many of us to the best gelato spots around the world. Okay, all kidding aside, he has spent countless hours writing books to help guide us in our previous adventures, whether as hobbyists or for our work. There is one book in particular that I rely on and recommend to everyone I talk to who wants to learn more about FreeBSD. So first, I have to say that this is a personal recommendation, and unfortunately, I don't receive any commissions for recommending any of Michael's books. But I just want to give a shout out to, hopefully you can see this, but Absolute FreeBSD, and it's the FreeBSD Bible, and I refer to this all the time. Another book that I want to recommend that I haven't read yet, but it has um, excellent reviews um, is it's called uh, FreeBSD Mastery Jails. And so I recommend everyone after this talk, if you're interested in learning more about jails, to order this book. So now I will hand this off to Michael. Thanks, Deb. Hello, everyone. Thank you for showing up. And uh, I am sharing my slide right now, so bear with me for just a moment. That's not the right slide. That's the right slide. Okay. There we go. So, jails. Jails are one of FreeBSD's most celebrated top, uh, features. And let's talk about why that is. If, if we were meeting in a, a conference right now, I would ask the audience, how many of you remembered the days before virtualization? Back then, operating system installs were important. You had entire meetings discussing how would the hard drive be partitioned? How would uh, memory be allocated? What software would be installed? So you had to agree on all of these things beforehand because you had to live with these installs for years, maybe even decades. So the OS install was vital. And that is what virtualization changed. All of a sudden, operating system installs were disposable. If you didn't like how an OS was installed, you could throw it away and redo it. So virtualization is the most revolutionary systems administration technology of my lifetime. Now a jail is a specific sort of virtualization called a lightweight virtual machine. It relies on the host operating system kernel, but provides all of the user land programs. A jail has been called a CH root on steroids. That's not entirely wrong, but it's not entirely correct. A CH root is a file system namespace transformation where you take a directory on the file system and say, this is now the root file system. So, uh, that's sort of what a jail is, except more so. 
a jail is a collection of namespace transformations. Yes, there's a file system transformation where a directory on the host becomes the jail's root directory, but there's also process IDs have a, this transformation. A jail can only see a small subset of the process IDs on the system. The network and IP addresses, the jail can only see the addresses allocated to the jail. And then usernames. Usernames in the jail are wholly separate from usernames on the host. The root account in the jail is not the same as root account on the host. And all of these namespaces are wholly subordinate to the host. You can think of a jail as a literal jail cell with a one-way mirror. The warden can see in, but inmates cannot peek out. Now, anytime we talk about virtualization and lightweight virtualization, you have people who have very fervent opinions that these technologies are or are not secure. And sysadmins get really heated about this topic. And the answer here, there is a single simple answer and it's very, very easy. Absolutely nothing is truly secure. Just look at a computer, a computer that's not running virtualization. How many operating systems are on this? Do you have RAID controllers? Do you have hard drives? Yes, a hard drive has an operating system. You can power it up, hook up a couple of cables to pins and get a terminal on it. Uh, CPU cache attacks were developed back in 2005. Uh, we didn't name them. We were too busy breaking the internet to market attacks, but we were attacking CPU OSs all the way down. Uh, motherboards now can be attacked while the system is running. Basically, it's turtles all the way down. So, would I use jails in a secure environment? What does secure environment even mean? Are you talking a telco grade facility where everything is non-flammable? Are you talking an environment where there are no direct TCP IP connections to the outside and everything must be proxied? Are you talking about building a web GUI to launch nuclear missiles? What problem are you really solving? Now here, I wouldn't build a web GUI to launch nuclear missiles, you're, you're really solving the wrong problem there. So look at your environment, look at your applications, and this tool may or may not fit. When it does fit, it's wonderful. Another thing to keep in mind about jails is they're not just for security. Constraining software to a specific environment can be very useful. Now, now, here's the thing about jails is they're complex. They're whole operating systems. The theory sounds very simple and the actual practice gets very complex very quickly. ZFS has a whole bunch of features for virtualization. But if you want to leverage them, you have to know ZFS. A lot of sysadmins are a little shaky on networks jails can do virtual networking. You still have to learn the networking before you can set it up. If someone says that you have a slash 27 for your network and you don't know what that means, you need to go learn some more before you can really use those features. Uh, if you don't know why virtual bridges aren't really bridges, maybe you should look at networking. If you don't know how ZFS clones and snapshots work, you should find that out before you deploy it in your jails because things get very complicated. Now, jails have been around for a long time. 
Uh, the earliest jail sort of code appeared sometime between 18 July 1975 and the 7th of May 1979. Uh, modern jails started in 1998 and developed very rapidly. And the biggest problem we have with them are obsolete documentation. Uh, original jails were very minimal and people would ask questions and you'd find out that no, you can't do that. And later on, people would develop a workaround and then they'd come up with the official way to do it and, and maybe even replace that official way with a better official way. And if you go poking around the web for tutorials, you'll learn a whole lot of things about how jails used to work. And you really need to check the date on things like tutorials and blog posts. Uh, I wrote this book for uh, just short of 2020 at the very end of 2019. And posts from about jails from 2005 are probably wrong, exactly like trying to use my book in 2035. So let's talk about the jail host, your FreeBSD install that's running on the hardware. This install is important. You have to live with decisions as long as the jails are running on it. Generally speaking, set up your hard drives in an expandable manner. Perhaps put the operating system on a mirrored set of drives and then set up ZFS pools that you can easily add more drives to, more VDEVs to. Uh, memory and CPU, however much you have, is not enough. For networking and IP addresses, I would tell you to dedicate one IP to the jail and bind all of the host's management services like SSH to that. So what you don't want to do is have the host's SSH service attaching to port 22 on every address of the on the host because that will override your jails. Jails need their own SSH. And the same for syslog and whatnot. Now, once you have a host, you can set up some jails. Jails get configured in Etsy jail.conf through parameters. There are parameters like you know, IP4.adder, the IP version 4 address, features that uh, can be turned on and off, like allow.mount, allow.mount devfs, saying what the jail can and cannot do. Some of these are booleans, some are variable, and some of these parameters change the jail just with their presence. It's kind of like when Darth Vader walks into the room, everything changes. So how would you set this up? Here I've defined a simple jail called log host. We're dumping all the logs here. We have parameters like host.hostname to set the host name, the IP address. The path is the host directory that is the root file system of this jail. And then we allow the jail to mount the device file system. Exec clean says wipe the environment of any host stuff before you start the jail. And then we define the commands to start and stop the jail. That seems pretty straightforward. And that would also be very time consuming to set all of those for every jail. So you can have default settings. Here we have defaults outside of a jail saying mount all of the jails by default can mount the device file system and have clean process environments and startup and, and these are the startup and shutdown scripts. And then we only have to define what is unique to the jail. Uh, in this case, that would be uh, the host name, the IP address, and the path to the root directory. Now we have this second jail, MariahDB, 
and we're overriding the default, thinking that we can write a custom startup script uh, that only starts what this jail needs. I don't generally recommend that, but it's possible. And then further, you can define variables. Here we set the variable cache j to slash j, sorry, to slash jail. And then we set as a default, the path to the cache j cache name. So, and then we, we have your, your host name is defined with variables and the IP host name parameter says, get the IP address from DNS. So we can define an entire jail with the name log host and just take the defaults. That's a lot simpler. And it also becomes very clear when we are overriding defaults. We've set up the MariahDB jail here and it has one parameter that's an override of the defaults. So once we have the jail configuration, what do you put in the directory? Well, all you need is the base TXZ of any FreeBSD release 4.0 or newer. This gets you back 20 years. Yes, you can use older FreeBSDs in a jail, but you need a custom kernel that has A.out support. And, and the old hats among you may remember that FreeBSD 4 used .tgz files instead of .txz. And if you know that off the top of your head, you're welcome to shush anytime. Now, your user land must be the same version or lower than the host. You can't run a FreeBSD 13 jail on a FreeBSD 12 host. Just doesn't work that way. So extract the user land, go into the directory, add a resolve.conf, add a base user, set your root password. You'll want to do some things like have an FS tab, an rc.conf. Systems fail in a surprising way if there is no file system table, even if they don't need it. And then you start the jail. You can either use the service command, you can use jexec. Uh, there are all kinds of convenient front ends for jails. And why do we have convenient front ends? I'm, I'm generally, I want to dig in deep and find out what's going on. Well, we do that because if you run raw jail commands and have to set commands and options and parameters on the command line, that's a seriously long set of stuff to type. Okay, let's talk about jail startup order. You have two ways to set this. There's an rc.conf parameter jail list that lists the jails you start and it starts in that order. There's also a parameter for jail.conf, depends. Here we say the log host depends on the host log DB. We want the database started first and then the log collector host. And things shut down in reverse order. Now, what jails are running? Well, JLS lists the jails you have, and there are all kinds of options to JLS to let you pick certain parameters and features out. For example, here I'm looking at what the running parameters are for the host log host. Since you have variables and default settings and can override, sometimes you may have the question of, of what is this jail really doing? It, it seems to be behaving weird. Are the parameters it's running with really correct? Well, you here you query the jail, find out what it's running with, and that will answer your question. You can also view select parameters. Uh, 
System 5 shared memory segments. Perhaps I'm a little old, but this was a big deal in a lot of systems. And depending on your environment, this may or may not be important. And certain settings will let information leak between jails, which you don't want. On the other hand, I'm told that there are people who rely on this information leaking through jails for system features, which are sorry for application features, which I, I find rather distressing. But OK, if, if that's what you want to do. Now, if you're on the host and you run PS, you're going to and you have a bunch of jails, you're going to see a whole bunch of jailed syslog processes and cron processes and, and all of these processes that normally you only have one of on a host. So the J flag indicates that a process is jailed. Here we have a bunch of jailed syslog and crons. You can also use the minus J flag to PS to grab the processes from a particular jail. PGREP, PKILL, TOP, and KILL ALL, all accept minus J, which means you can manage the jail from the host itself. You can also execute commands inside the jail using J exec. Now here, uh, the minus L purges the environment. I'm running a command in the host log host. And the command is login minus F root. In general, always purge your environment with minus L. You do not want stuff from your host to feed into the jail. At at best, it will just be annoying. At worst, you can actually break things. One thing people often need is to run commands before and after a jail starts. And here are some jail parameters to do that. These are commands you can run on the host. Perhaps you need to open up the host's packet filter before the jail starts. Or you want to open it during boot, but close it after the jail is running. Here I've done just some simple things with logging. Logging jail start and stop can be useful for debugging. It, it's kind of the printf of system administration. We've also added a console log where we temporarily log the jail console. So let's talk package management. Use package and make a decision before you start. Are you going to manage packages from the host or inside the jail. There are advantages and disadvantages to each and everybody has their own prejudices and this could be another long drawn out argument that nobody wants to have. I choose to manage the packages on the host uh, mainly because I've seen on occasion package can be very slightly different between different FreeBSD releases. And it, it is just simpler to know that I have ruled out that problem. It's only bit me once in the last 10 years or so, and that was enough. So, and no matter which method you use, the package database resides inside the jail. OK. Now let's get into some of the nifty things that people try to do with jails. The big thing is, of course, space optimization. Having many copies of this same user land, it feels inelegant. And, and sysadmins don't like inelegant. 
these other ways to, to use disk space and save it are, are definitely more elegant, but they are also more complicated. And sysadmins have this in, inherent tendency towards complication that, that we have to kind of sit on and, and restrain ourselves. So my, my rule of thumb is that file system optimization is directly proportional to downtime because you have to debug your own cleverness. So with that warning, how would we optimize space? Well, there are three standard methods, clones, templates, and base jails. A clone is just a, a ZFS uh, clone and you start with an identical machine. Templates are where you install once and deploy many times. With base jails, you literally recycle the same user land over and over. So, cloning with ZFS is as simple as a ZFS clone command. And then go into the clone, you remove the host's SSH keys, you change the root password. And this is extremely useful for things like testing upgrades. If you're not sure what the Postgres upgrade is going to do, clone the, clone the database jail, run the upgrade, see what happens. Now, a clone source that has a bunch of stuff already installed is a template. That, that's all. You might set up a template web server that already has your chosen server application, your chosen uh, administration tools. And then when you deploy a new web server, you just, boom, there it is. Run package upgrade, everything's patched, done. Now, the thing to remember about ZFS clones is they grow in size. Initially, you could fit hundreds of thousands of ZFS clones on a single one terabyte hard drive. Once you start to use those machines, that drive will fill very quickly. Base jails. Base jails for many people are the holy grail of disk optimization. You have literally one user land and many jails use it. They all use null mounts to provide this basic user land. When you upgrade the one user land, all of your jails are simultaneously upgraded. And this sounds really nifty. And basically all you do for this is you set up a custom FS tab for each. So here I have an LDAP server. And this is what the FS tab looks like for that. So packages though, each jail either needs its own packages or you have to say that all the jails have absolutely identical packages. Absolutely and totally no questions. This means you'd need a jail for you know, FreeBSD with PHP 7.2 and another for PHP 5.6. Yes, I know PHP 5.6 is obsolete and I sincerely hope one day to have the time and resources to stop using it. Eventually, when I get there, I can repoint that base jail to the modern PHP jail and everything will be fine. So let's talk about jail features and controls. Jails have changed over the decades. Things that started off as impossible became very grossly configurable and, and then finally configurable. 
And this basically boils down to the things that are unthinkable with on a host with 128 meg of RAM are just trivial when you have 128 gig. Technology and hardware resources have advanced so much that some things are now worthwhile to do. It's no different than when ZFS first came out, many file systems, they turned off integrity checking because it was so computing intensive. And now we just, you know, we integrity check slash temp because we can. So an example of this process is system five IPC that is used by uh, many applications, notably databases. Originally, all the jails shared System 5 IPC space. If you ran multiple jails that had database, that had, say, Postgres in them, they all accessed the same memory space. And this was bad. You had to avoid it. You had one jail that accessed System 5 IPC, and the sysadmin had to keep other applications out. In, in Middle Age, we could turn system five IPC on and off with this syscatal uh, security jail sys five IPC. Uh, last I checked, it's still there. But now you can configure this same feature with per jail parameters. So look where, look in the syscatals for things that are jailed. Look in the parameters, search around for different controls to accomplish things. Okay, we're gonna head now into some less widely known things about jails. You can delegate management of certain file systems to jails. The lsvfs command, it displays install jail safe file systems. Some file systems will never be jail safe. You cannot manage UFS inside a jail. UFS is tightly tied to the virtual memory stack and they, they, they have this unholy knowledge of each other and separating that out in the virtual memory stack. Well, we just got them integrated and now you want us to take it apart? No, no, that, that, this is not happening. So, but you can, things like ZFS is, defi is designed to be jail safe. The device file system, lots of reasons why you might need uh, a per jail DevFS. So look at those parameters on your host, see what you can do. Jail networking. Jails can have multiple addresses, but one IP can be bound to one and only one jail. Jails cannot share an address. If you need raw sockets like ping, if you are custom building packets, you need the parameter allow socket AF. The AF stands for AF INET, not anything else you might think AF stands for. IPs can be shared if and only if it's the only IP that all the jails have, that, that all the jails with that IP have. And all of this works great until localhost. Um, 127.001, uh, for those of you in, in the increasingly small IPv4 world, or colon colon one, is the host's loopback address. And if anything tied to that, it would expose all the jails to each other easily. So the, the kernel lies. The, loop, the jail's loopback address is its public IP. So if you say, oh, this will be fine. This application only listens on localhost. No. That is the public IP and you need to cope with that. 
So there is a way around that, though. VNet. VNet in the default in FreeBSD 12, it lets you set up a virtual network stack and let the jail configure its own networking. It can run its own firewall, and so on and so on. Now, there are old stories that VNet was buggy. Well, development on VNet started around 2006. If you tried it in a year with two zeros in the middle, yeah, it was buggy. But we've been pounding on this for years, and VNet is solid enough now that the host itself runs in VNet zero. So when you start playing with VNet, make a network diagram, figure out how these things are all going to hook together. It's very easy to get confused, especially if you start playing with bastion hosts and whatnot. So let's look at some lesser, some even lesser known things. Hierarchical jails. You can run jails that can run their own jails inside them. This is very useful for development. If you're running your application inside a jail, you can hand the dev team a jail that runs its own jails and say, here, you figure out what you need and then we'll deploy it. Uh, highly useful for that. You can jail old servers. Now, th this is one of my favorite things to do. The last straight job I had had a mission critical application that was running on FreeBSD 4. It was run in house. Sorry, it was written in house. There was no outside support. It was on like PHP 2 and MySQL 3, something along those lines. And the hardware was a repurposed desktop that somehow had not died in the last 15 years. And, and this, their, their backup plan was an identical model of abandoned desktop to restore the machine onto. And, and this basically horrified me. So I tarred up that system, copied the tarball to a FreeBSD, it, it was 10 or 11 at the time, I think, untarred it there and set it up in a jail. And that got me modern backups. I was able to turn off the host's SSH service and packet, sorry, I was able to turn off the, the legacy application packet filter and SSH and rely on the host's modern versions and basically strip this down as far as possible. And this way, if that machine blew up, who cared? We just restore it and it is back. You can also install Linux in a jail. And I, I have been told by a variety of developers that they have actually used this to help them port device drivers over to FreeBSD. I do not know how this works. I am not a kernel developer. I, I have not lived a bad enough life to be sentenced to that fate. But they tell me it works and it's useful. If, if you are one of those poor condemned souls, give it a try. You can, you can impose resource limits on jails through RC Catal and CPU set. If you don't want, say, your application server to monopolize all the CPUs, uh, you can say, this jail has these two CPUs and that's it. You could say, no, no, this server is for, it is dedicated to this application. We're running it in a jail uh, to contain it all in one place. And so the host itself gets dedicated access to one CPU and all of the other CPUs go to the application. That way, if your jail goes insane 
and monopolizes all of its CPUs, you can still connect into the host and run PS and see what's going on and do some debugging. Very useful. Um, and you can set some very arbitrary limits on resources. My, my favorite experiment was to, uh, I set a limit of 30 seconds on how long init could run and then it would get a SIG kill. And it worked. The jail died. So, oh my for time. I'm good on time. Okay. One of my favorite tricks is to use an incomplete jail, which is where we transform most of the namespaces, but not all. Uh, suppose you're running a virtual server and you get one IP, but you want to jail your database and your web server. So what you can do is say, all right, we're going to jail these, but they all use the same IP address. And there was just a sound on this, but I'm going to ignore it, I suppose. Uh, and this beats the heck out of these firewall tricks people use to redirect to locally bound addresses on the loopback. You could run a very small user land to figure out exactly what is needed. You could jail, but jail to the whole file system. And this would make sense for that application server that you want to restrict the, the CPUs it can use. And, and a lot of this seems counterintuitive, but really, what problem are you trying to solve? You can use this much like C groups in Solaris. Now, a lot of people are looking for something like Docker, where they can manage their jails through a command line. I use IOCage for this. It's built on ZFS. It is specifically designed to manage jails entirely through the command line. And one of the reasons I like it is because they have plugins. You can download these pre-configured single-purpose jails and install servers with a single command. Uh, if you need to do something like Elasticsearch or Plex, things that are kind of a pain to set up the first time, this is how you do it. So that's it for the main talk. Uh, the IRS says I should tell you that I ha write books. You can have some. And so, questions and answers. Do we have any? We do have questions. We do. Um, <laughs> yes, Excellent. We have answers. Um, so I'm going to read them to you. I'm also going to paste them in a channel that, Michael, you can see in case what I say doesn't make sense. <laughs> OK. Um, so <clears throat> the first one, and some of these have been answered within IRC, but I think we'd like to have them answered in the uh, recorded video as well. So. OK. Um, the first question, would a base jail be analogous to a Solaris sparse stone? Uh, I haven't worked with that, so I cannot authoritatively answer. I, I, I would say everybody has tried everything before. So I would not be shocked to find out that's the case. Okay. Uh, the next question, do all jails still possibly need an IPv4 address, even if it's only an RFC 1918 address? Or can one make an IPv6 only jail? If so, does it require VNet or is it available in jails without VNet configured? You know, that's a great question. I've never tried it. Well, I am absolutely useless for answering your questions. Uh, There's more. There's more. Don't worry. Uh, um, all right, let's see. Oh, another question comes in. Have you checked that jails can't share an IP address? Uh, it causes chaos, but if I recall, uh, the kernel doesn't protect you from yourself. That's what the uh, the IP4 inherit. Oh, no, 
No, yes, you. They can share if and only if it's the only address on the jails. Two jails can share the same address. Uh, if and only if that's the only address they have. And yes, you have to coordinate all of that. That that's really kind of annoying. Okay. Um, there's more. There's more. Yep. Okay. Here we go. This ought to be interesting. Uh, what happens to colon colon one slash one two seven dot zero dot zero one on jails with multiple addresses? Is it possible to use colon colon two and one two seven dot zero dot zero two instead? I haven't tried that either. <laughs> As I said, people have tried many things with jails. I, I'm okay. sorry. I, I have an authoritative answer for the next question, though. Okay, good, good. All right, so the next question is, do jails support having a different date and time in the jails versus the host? No, you can set a different time zone, okay. which is similar, but not the same. The, the time comes from the colonel. The, a jail cannot change the time. Okay. Okay. And we have one more here. Um, <clears throat> it says, you mentioned Docker at the end of the talk. What is the similarity or dissimilarity between jails and Docker? Oh. Docker frustrates and enrages me far more frequently than jails do. Um, but There are, uh, there are similar approaches with a lot of different edges around them. Last I checked, jails were more complete than Docker. They, their, their lightweight virtualization was more complete. That may have changed in the last three months. Okay. Oh, and, and Docker, there are many more Docker images available, but they are, like a lot of Linux packages, they're available on random sites, and, and you're, people are kind of accustomed to just grabbing them off of wherever. So there's no sense of central auditing that you get with the official IO Cage plugins. Okay. Um, their next question is, what do you think about very tiny jails? For example, a single binary rsync. I think that that is an extremely useful exercise for any system administrator. That is one of the first things I tried to learn exactly what was necessary to run a program. And Disk space now is so plentiful that in production, it's very rarely worth the effort. But trying to build it, kind of like trying to build a home firewall, is, is such a, a, an education that you can't get any other way. And it will really give you a lot of respect for embedded developers. By the time you get our sync to work inside this jail, you will, and you understand that that's only one small piece of what the embedded people do. Uh, you will uh, appreciate them a great deal more, and you will learn gobs about Unix. Cool. Okay. Are there any more questions? Uh, oh, here's one. All right. <clears throat> uh, I want to set up a system environment, Linux, just for my Python-based development. I would need to use Jupyter Notebooks. Is this a suitable use case for jails? Um, I don't know why not. Off the top of my head, I would say, yeah, give it a try. It should work. Okay. 
right. All right. Any other questions? Okay. I think that might be it for the questions for right now. And okay. So we'll, uh, bring Deb back. <laughs> I'm back. I All think. Right. I you can see me. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would like to say thank you, Michael, for that excellent talk. Um, I've been really enjoying these sort of FreeBSD 101 type of talks. And, um, and they're great because they introduce us to these topics and then we can always go out and explore more on um, the areas that we're interested in. And I really liked your analogy at the beginning of using an actual jail cell <laughs> to explain a jail where it's a like a one-way mirror and if I'm the warden or the correctional officer that I can look in and see the prisoner but the prisoner can't see see me. So I think that's a, just like such a simple way of viewing what a jail is. Well, um, really, I stole that. That's Paul Henningkamp's <laughs> example. And and it's everything with my books. People think they're good, but really, I've just stolen from the best. Well, good. But you put it, but you write your books in a way that make it really um, interesting and informative for us, and um, as well as entertaining, too. You... Um, have very clever sense of humor. I think I said that at the beginning. And it makes the books really engaging. I mean, when you have a book like this, Absolute Free BSD, um, you, it's interesting. And so not only do I want to learn about Free BSD, but I enjoy your humor and it just keeps me engaged. And um, so I really appreciate that. Um, I do want to remind people that um, if you want to learn more about jails, that um, that we have, um, or not we, but there is FreeBSD Mastery Jails that you can buy. And um, so I heard that there's a couple more questions that came in. Um, oh, sure. So since we have the time, and do you want to? Yep. You want to? Oh, and, and thank you, Deb. That's very kind. You're welcome. Uh, All um, right. Go ahead. A few more questions have, have come in. Um, Next question, why did you pick IOCage over the other high-level jail managers? The, the short answer is because I preferred it. It had the most complete feature set. It had the plugins. It, it was built around ZFS. That's the, the, the main drivers for, if, if you're building the kind of jail system where you need command line operations for everything, then you're, it's going to be on a ZFS host because you're going to have a lot of disk. And I wanted something that really leveraged that. So uh, IO Cage seemed the best candidate and the, the lead developer as I was writing took bugs and missing features as a, a personal threat and attacked them voraciously. All right. Um, next question. Uh, what is the best way to run and build software from ports in a jail? Well, Poudrier. Poudrier is the, the standard free BSD tool for building ports in mass on, in scale. And I would tell you if you have to build your own ports, uh, use Poudrier to build a repo of your ports, mount that across, mount your new repository read only across your jails and install from there. Okay, here's one I think we're all wanting to know. Um, where's the gelato? In the refrigerator for when I'm <laughs> done with you people. <laughs> that's, that's an important place for it, I feel. And where do you live? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we do have one more, one more question. Um, when would you recommend vanilla jails versus when you would recommend IOCage? How complex 
is your environment. Now, my web server, I, I've got it down to six jails right now because there, there's you know, database, uh, email, website, and a couple other things. And I'm just using vanilla jails for that because it's very straightforward. If I got any more complicated, or if this was my day job, and I knew perfectly well that the boss who told me, oh, this is a small thing and it's not going to grow, don't worry about it. Any of those, you know, I, I know you can't trust that statement. Because once you've demonstrated you can do a thing, they want more and more of it. Any of those, I would use IOCage. Okay, excellent. I do think that might actually be the last question this time, uh, at least for now. If more questions do come in um, after we're done, um, we can pop them into Twitter and have uh, Michael answer them there. Um, yeah. And then we'll make sure that we have a, a record of them somewhere. So, um, all right, I will again hand it back to Deb and thank you, Michael. <laughs> yeah, and thank you Anne, for asking the questions. I know sometimes those are pretty difficult. Um, and again, thank you again, Michael. Thank you for staying on a little bit longer to to answer those questions that came in. And um, and there was one question I did see. Um, someone was asking if that is Groff on the bookshelf behind me. I believe that was Mark <laughs> Yes. So that is uh, Groff's uh, twin brother. So I am not the handler right now, and um, I believe Groff is actually in Germany waiting for. Uh, COVID to disappear and can start traveling again. So we look forward to um, meeting and, and or seeing um, the original graph, the BSD goat. So uh, it's a good question. So anyway, um, so I want to introduce or let you know that next week, or I'm sorry, gosh. Um, so our previously Fridays or every other Friday now. And so the next one will be October 9th. And it will be Introduction to Cherry BSD by Dr. Robert Watson. So, Ooh. yeah. So, um, I really, well, everyone, you know, every topic we're doing, I'm just so excited about. So, um, so anyway, so I think we're all excited about that one. That one. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in. And we will see you in two weeks. So thank you.